<laughs> okay, a um, couple things in terms of the exam will start with the oxidation, with the oxidation reagents. Um, remember there's strong, and then there's the weak ones that only oxidize a primary alcohol to an aldehyde. And also in that, so that, that lecture is where it'll start. Also in that lecture I talked about having um, something like this where you have a double bond and an, al and an aldehyde or a carbonyl group. And there were different reagents that you could use to reduce that. Lithium aluminum hydride. <coughs> Hydrogen and palladium, or hydrogen and rainy nickel. Would we need to know? No, you just would need to know what each reagent does. So there was there was H two and rainy nickel. There was H two, which is palladium or platinum, and then there was using lithium aluminum hydride, and then H plus H two O. So remember, some of those reagents, one of those reagents reduced both, and then one of them just reduced the carbonyl, and the other one just reduced the double bond. Wait, you said for um, the weak oxidation reagent, it oxidizes in what? A, a primary alcohol into an aldehyde. Oh. Uh, in terms of KMNO4, um, if it's in the basic. Conditions or acidic conditions, do we have to worry about that? Whether it's H3O or H2O? No. Uh, the KMNO4 will oxidize. So, the strong, so when you have the strong oxidizers like KMNO4 and the chromium and all the chromium 6 reagents, um, they'll, they'll take a primary alcohol all the way up to a carboxylic acid and they'll also take a secondary alcohol <laughs> bless you they'll take a secondary alcohol to a ketone the the acid or base with camino 4 depended on when you wanted to cleave a double bond or add 2 OH assist that's the only time camino 4 it needs to be specified whether it's acidic or basic <laughs> So that's the lecture that the material will start on. Can we use any BH4 to reduce the carbonyl only two or you could as long as it's an aldehyde or a ketone. So yeah, you could use NABH4 here as well. You can't use NABH4 to reduce carboxylic acid. That's too that requires the strongest, which is the lithium aluminum hydride. So that's where the material starts. And then if you go back and you think about what was next, what was next? Next was free radical, was sort of the free radical halogenations. I'll give you the selectivities for those. Um, you won't have to calculate a percentage. You'll just have to maybe write all the possible products, all the possible unique products, and then circle a major one. And if three time or if four times three point four is too taxing mathematically, then I suppose you can use a calculator. So do you want us to memorize those ratios or even I get No, I'll give them to you. Okay. I'll give them to you on the test. You just have to know what to do with it. Okay. Um so so that's the free radical. As far as mechanisms go if you think about the mechanisms that we've done since the last exam, we've done um, one two one four addition. We've done free radical halogenation. We also did making an ether from two alcohols, as well as cleaving the al cleaving the ether to make two alkyl halides. And you could also throw in the, you know, the pero to form the peroxide from an ether. But those are the mechanisms that we've done. And for four of those five, you've had take-home quizzes or 
um, homework problems. So it's a very limited set of mechanisms, but that doesn't mean I can't ask them all. And then as far as reactions go, making ethers from the alcohols and acid, cleaving the ethers, um, free radical halogenation, as I said. And then we did allylic systems, um, free radically halogenating allylic systems. And the difference between taking something like this and reacting it with BR2 light at room temperature versus reacting it with NBS in terms of brominating at the allylic position. And then we also, um, we also talked at the same point about sort of brominating at the benzylic position, but I think we'll save that for the next test. So the bromination um, at the allylic system is important. And then the allylic carbocations, and then 1214, kinetic thermodynamic, those reactions, being able to write the products, as well as being able to write the mechanisms, and then also the diels alders the diels alder reactions. And let's see. And since I already had written the test, somebody said, how about aromatic compounds or not? And then I had to remember what I wrote, what I put on the test. And I do not believe I put aromatic. It'll be on the next test. So you won't have to judge whether something's ar aromatic, anti-aromatic, etc. Any other thing? Any other thing was the protection of the alcohol with a silo chloride. That will be protection. The protection, the silo chloride reacting with OH to protect it. We did an example of that. So, so I, that's not my memory is never comprehensive, but I think that was. I mean, if you're going to do the same thing I do, that is go to Canvas and look at the notes and click on the notes and then click on the next day and the next day and the next day. And you refresh yourself in terms of what was on there. But that's what I, that's what I, that's what I do. So that's, so that's sort of the overview of the of the material hope and hopefully it's not nothing surprising because today's Wednesday hopefully you've already gone back and begun to take a look at that <coughs> long before Wednesday um, and then one other thing sort of so when we come back on Monday the 11th I'm going to be live lecturing about, I mean, we're going to get a little caught up. If you look at the older exams, you're going to see additions into the benzene ring as well as the reactions of the side chains around the benzene ring. Um, those we have not gotten to yet, so we will get to those. Um, so I'll be live lecturing when we come back on the 11th from break. Also that day, we're going to have a panel discussion in chemistry for um, we're going to have a panel, I think, of six alumni that are coming in that are in various fields. I think one is a, one is a teacher, or one is in pharmacy, a couple work um, in the chemical industry, um, one works for Smuckers. Um, I think that's... Hey, there's there's another place. Anyway, they're coming in for a career a discussion about you know what you can do with a with a chemistry which is, which would be very similar to what you can do with a biology degree. So if you're interested in that's going to be Monday the 11th. I you may have already gotten an email from that uh, Mrs. Yan already sent out 
there's probably two of them because the first flyer said it would be in 329, but I'm hoping we have more people so that we can use the A202201 that's over here. But they'll be there. They'll be, I think it starts at 330 with, what is it, a hors d'oeuvre social hour or something. You can talk to them. And I, this is, Alicia planned all this, so with with Mrs. Yawn. So it's it's a, we wanted students students to um, help, help um, this, career, this career panel. And if you're going to be a chemistry major, it'll count towards the career panel requirement um, for the professional development CAS professional development program. I don't know about if you're going to be a biology major because you'd have to talk to them and ask you about that. I don't know if career if career events can cross disciplinary lines. I haven't seen her to ask that. So I mean, if you're interested in seeing what kind of, I think one person I know is a biology major, but some of the other ones were, uh, there might be a double major thrown in there. So I mean, it's, it's kind of science oriented. So I want to announce, because I won't announce that on Friday. So, and you've gotten your email, so I'll announce it when we get back, but then you can kind of plan through it. We'll probably be having one of these a year at least. It depends. Okay, so that's so you know keep keep that in mind. And also, it's not. I'm going to be going over over break. I'm going to go through the professional development, um, the website I have on Canvas to just make sure that everybody is for it because remember you do have to do a resume a cover letter and a, as those are three those are three assignments and somebody came this morning and they said I don't have access to it so I haven't gotten a chance to check if you find that out email me and I'll add you and I'll add you to the chemistry one but the chemistry one right now has everybody for some reason so when you finish things out and then move to another major like biology, it'll go with you into the biology one. So it's just right now they knew we were doing it organic. I think Dr. I think Dr. Kwan's giving bonus points, but bonus points are very easy to come by in that. So, okay. all right. What else in terms of questions? Um, I was doing the practice problems, and for this one, I was just confused why you had like one, two, three, okay. Like why you had like three dashboards at the end. Like I understood the first two, but then that third one, I don't know. Well, so for that one, I guess I was kind of showing for deals alters. So for the deals alter reaction, this molecule right here can can actually the middle molecule. The, I'm going to treat each of the dienes as if it was an alkene. So in this problem, this central molecule can undergo two Diels alders. So here would be the first Diels alder of reacting this the um, butadiene with this um, molecule. So we would again have a six-membered ring. We always form a six-membered ring, and if you're numbering, it's always with a bond between one and five and four and six, and a double bond then between two and three. Now what's attached to carbons five and six? What's attached to carbon five is this. And so let's just make sure five double bond, double bond. Let me write seven, eight, and nine. Because this is how you keep yourself from making mistakes. So there's my seven, eight, nine carbon. Hold on. So since this was cis, I could make the what? Seven is the aldehyde, so seven, eight, 
nine, ten. Don't fall much. Just numbering can just numbering will not necessarily prevent you from writing the wrong structure. That's what I'm illustrating there. So they could either have both bold or dashed wedges. So the other thing, so if you wanted to, to do a second deals alder, it's going to get really complicated because you could react eight or nine as the, as the alkene or you could react two or three. So the problem is if we react eight or nine, so I'm going to write the whole left hand part of the molecule back. then for this double bond would now have a six membered ring with a double bond there. Now what kind of what kind of bonds would you use here? I guess it would have to have a bold wedge. The simple fact of the matter is if I'm showing a bold wedge here then in order for that to be cis it'd have to be a bold wedge there. So that's why it's got the multiple wedges. But you added like in the practice problem it was added to the Two, three, let's say other side. Okay. So if it's there, it could be again, it's got to be cis. So we need a bold wedge there and a bold wedge there. Then I'm going to make my six membered ring here. So, in other words, I'm going to add my cyclo or my butadiene to two and three. And so here I could have. Again, they have to be, there would probably be a mixture of cis and trans. Sorry, there would be a mixture of bold and dashed. Either both bold or both dashed. Okay, I just confused because there's only one. It's probably a typo. But what this shows is that you can do multiple deals alders. And actually, this is, this is kind of what happens we didn't talk about the importance of the Diels Alder reaction. And the importance of the Diels Alder reaction, just for a moment, is that I could take So I could take this molecule, I've got to get the, get the methyl group in the right place, which would be that. So what can happen is, is that this molecule right here is called isoprene. And so isoprene can undergo a diels alder reaction with itself. And when it does that, it forms a six-membered ring with it would form that along with the methyl group there, and then the double bond between carbons two and three, which would be here. So this is actually called limonene. So if you know what limonene is, anybody know what limonene is? What? It's in limes. So it's basically a component of essential oils. So if you took a lime peel or a lemon peel or a orange peel and you either steam distilled it like we did in lab to form with the cloves or you press it called cold pressing, what you would get out is some limonene. And so limonene basically is, is a component in like orange peel oil. And so this is what plants do. Plants do these deals alder reactions to form these type of components that make up their essential oils. And they're all sort of, some of them are bicyclic. So um, 
we've seen these structures before, the base of those. Sometimes they've got two methyls here. Sometimes they've got a double bond there. This is camphor. I think I might have a methyl right there too. That's camphor. If you go out and grab a bunch of pine needles, you're going to have camphor in it. It has a piney smell. There used to be a, a mussel sort of rub called camphophenique that smelled like that. So it's plants are able to do deals all the reactions in order to form these different compounds. And so that's actually where the importance of the deals alders come from, is their ability to put these isoprene units. So if, so if this if it comes from an isoprene, that molecule would be called a like it would be there's a terpene molecule, but um, they're basically called sort of pinene type structures. So you end up with you end up with all those different compounds. They have the same chemical makeup, or very similar chemical makeups. They just have different smells. So like if you paint with oil paint, you have to clean your brush with like turpentine. Turpentine has a turpentine-like smell. Very few people paint with paint with oil-based paints now, right? Because we have latex. But if you do, you have to clean it with an oil. An oil-based paint has to be cleaned with something like turpentine, which has a turpentine-like smell. It's not very pleasant. So if you use limonene, orange peel oil, paint strippers came on the market. They were sold like through late night advertisements, which I don't know if they still exist or not. But they would say, "Oh, look at this! Smells really great, and I can pour it on my furniture, and I can strip all the paint off of it." Well, of course you can, because the difference chemically of limonene and, tur and turpentine is pretty small. It's just one smells better than the other. So it was used as a paint stripper because it smelled good, and but it chemically is pretty much the same. So the, so when you, like, who does deals all the reactions? Plants. And if you're interested in essential oils and stuff like that, that's a pretty important reaction. Most people don't really care about plants. Non-food growing plants. Right? They're there. But they use a lot of deals all the So in this case, this was just to show you that you could get multiple reactions. You, as long as these two positions are on the, using the same wedge, you're okay. What else? The mechanism for forming a peroxide. So, what we have to remember is oxygen is in its diamagnetic state or in its paramagnetic state where it has two unpaired electrons. So I'm going to treat the oxygen gas as if it was a radical, which it is. And so my first step would be to break a CH bond and pair up that C that H with that oxygen radical. And that's going to leave, that's going to have the hydrogen go to one of the oxygens and then leave a carbon radical. And then they're going to couple together in the second step so that those two unpaired electrons will couple together. And if they couple together, you end up with the peroxide forming. So it's pretty straightforward. You just have to remember that the oxygen is in its paramagnetic form.
explain endo and exo products? Like, so there's two possible fused ring systems that you might see. So looking at the two positions over here, there are equatorial positions and then there are axial positions. Looking at them from this standpoint. So the positions that are basically not, if you imagine a cylinder, if you imagine that these are kind of, these molecules are in a cylinder, the positions that are pointing outside would be what we would call axo. They're going to be the, equ the equatorial positions. So those are the exo positions. Then the axial positions are going to be the endo. And if I look at those positions, the endo positions being axial are going to be opposite the bridge. They're opposite this bridge. So that if I wrote the molecule where I might have a bridge with the CH2 and then showing the bridge that way, which would be me up here looking down, that means that if these are bold, the other groups, the XO positions are going to be dashed. And the important thing about this is when you react a cyclic diene with a cis alkene, you're always going to get this this endo product. You're always going to get the endo product where the bridge and the two groups have opposite wedges. So the bridge, is it supposed to be CH3 or CH2? It's a CH2. And then if you were looking at this one, it would be two CH2s. So there would be a CH2, another CH2, and then the bridge. Bless you. So you can write your product either way. I'm going to erase this. So you can you can have it either looking at it this way, but then again, the end of product has to have the opposite wedge of the bridge. And if you don't give the bridge a wedge, it falls into the category of don't make me guess. Right? Because if I guess, if I have to guess on one of your answers on an exam, I 100% guess wrong. I've never got a guess right. So don't make me guess. No. Although, I always thought that like EXO was forbidden because it's one of those rules that the world ends if we ever violate it, but apparently that's not the case. Because when I was looking up over the summertime to try and modify our deals alter reaction that we did in lab recently, I did find, I just wanted to do the same one although actually I looked at some others and they actually said if we go to high temperatures we can get the exo to form so but it's but it's not the reason that it forms endo is not because necessarily that's a thermodynamic product and the exo is the kinet is sort of a well in this case the kinetic and the thermodynamic product would have to be the same 
because I can't switch. I can only switch by raising the temperature, but it's about orbitals and forbidden orbitals and all of that stuff. So, but it is possible to get it, but you're not gonna you're not gonna write it. And if you react a tra a cyclic, if you react a cyclic dying with a trans, or sorry, yeah, yeah trans alkene, then one group is bold, one group is dashed. That product doesn't have a name. So the product for that reaction would be something like this, where you do have your bold bridge, but then you would have one bold CN, and you would have a dashed CN. So that's that product doesn't have a name, but it would form. So the critical part is the stereochemistry here is the same as the stereochemistry there. That's what's preserved. Um, to clarify, when the uh, like the cyclohexane or pentane or whatever attaches to it, is the uh, part that sticks up? Is that the like one from the in this case the pentane, or is that from the? So I mean, this is the this is the CH two that's going to be sticking up here. Okay. So let's see. Let me re let me redraw that product, and I can color code. And I can color code what it what it would look like. So. And I can color code it from scratch. So here is the dying, and here is and there's the trans alkene. And it's different colors because that apparent that one apparently blue changes as as I push down harder or less hard. It is. So here's, here's what the two products would look like. So our first ring so this would be the five-membered ring of the cyclo of the cyclopentadiene, bless you. And then the black is going to be the two bonds that are being formed. And then this one is going to be that part. So I don't know in lab if, if for your deals all the report you have to like tell what give what molecules have to be reacted in order to form the deals alder. I'm it, that's not my that's not in my section, but the way we would think about deconstructing the deals alder would be like this: everything in red would come from the diene, and then the two bonds that we would form, and then everything in blue is from the is from the alkene. So that's where the CH2 comes from. Is it's the bridge, it's the it's basically the, the group that makes the ring cyclic, that makes it diene cyclic. And let's see, I can do that here too. So there's that ring. There's the two bonds that are being formed. And then there's what it would look like.
Why is bromine more selective? Um, the ultimate reason why bromine is more selective is because in the rate determining step of going from a CH bond reacting with a BR dot, in order to form that radical, that reaction is endothermic. And for chlorination, that reaction, same reaction of the carbon with the hydrogen reacting with the Cl dot, producing then the radical, is exothermic. Now, if I could... That diagram isn't quite isn't quite accurate, but let's see if I can. Where's my mouse? accurate if I'm forming the same radical they have to be at the same energy so that's what the diagram would look like so that these two are the same energy so the reason chlorine is less selective is because it's exothermic so remember that the difference here is if I made a more stable carbocation that would pull down the activation energy, but these activation energies are already relatively small. So the rate enhancement of making a more stable carbo uh, more stable radical would be low would be less enhanced. The rates would be similar and there would be less of a difference between the rates than if we have to go uphill. So if I lower that, that's gonna be those difference in activation energies are gonna be more significant. And so that's what the rate that's what the rate um, the rate would be far different. That's why we get the 1700 to 80 to 1 versus the 5 to 3.4 to 1. So because the reaction is already starting out exothermic, it's only 3.4 out of, it's only Five over 3.4 times faster to form a tertiary than a secondary. And because the activation energy, because this is an endothermic and you've got to go uphill, that's what gives you a 1700 to 80 to only 80 ratio. And I wouldn't, and I wouldn't ask you to, you know, give that explanation unless I want to spend all spring break grading essay responses. Don't don't discount that. I'm I might I might be tempted to do that. But if I didn't then I would just be asking you to write the major products. Well, no, I'm sorry. I'd be asking you to write all the unique products and circle the major ones. Or major ones if there's ties. Reaction with NBS would be on there. So if we went back to that, so there's two possible, two possible. Why am I writing rings?
So here's product A and here's product B. So what would be my product if I reacted this alkene, if I reacted that molecule with bromine light at room temperature? Hold on. Everybody have an answer of A or B? So how many people say A? How many people say B? Okay, does everybody have... You didn't get my first part when I said, does everybody have an answer in their mind? Well, then you should say no. Because then I ask and only 30% participate. And when's the last time I chastised somebody for a wrong answer? Oh, I might have done that one day. <laughs> but it wasn't mean, unless you take it as being mean. So let's try it again. A, how many people say A? How many people say B? Oh, the B's dropped off. So the reason, why is it A? Why when I react this double bond with bromine light and, and at room temperature do I get the addition? It's because the free radical halogenation reaction occurs at a little bit slower rate than does the bromine. Does the bromine addition to the double bond? It's one of those things that you would that I probably sh if you go on YouTube and look at look at a fr at, just type in free radical halogenation or bromination, and I'm sure you can find videos from people that are far more more motivated to make those videos than I am. But if you add bromine to an alkene, the orange bromine color immediately disappears. Whereas if you add it to an alkane. At, you have to actually shine the light on it. It doesn't immediately disappear. It takes a while. And you can think about that mechanism because it's a free radical halogenation, all six steps. So the free radical reaction is much slower. So when a bromine, molecular bromine, sees a double bond, it's going to react with it like that. So that means you're going to add two bromines. I know you add two bromines trans. I didn't mean to show the stereochemistry here because there is no stereochemistry because it's a alkane with free rotation. So that means if you want to free radically halogenate at the allylic position, that's when we needed to use our NBS. And our NBS, and you don't need to know the structure of this, but our NBS was succinamide and bromo. So and bromo succinamide. And that usually requires something like heat. Just simply because it's got to, you have some heat to go. So with NBS, there's no um, greater than 300 degrees Celsius. But you're only going to use NBS in the presence of something that's going to react with Br2, which is a double or a triple bond. So in that case, you're going to brominate exclusively at the allylic position. We didn't really talk about the mechanism. What we talked about was kind of the what we did. So what did we do? We had like an OH and something like a BR. And I think if I remember correctly, we wanted to add magnesium metal to our BR. And then we wanted to add CO2 to that to make a carboxylic acid. And so what would happen if the magnesium reacted with the bromine without protection? We would end up making a C minus, and that C minus would do what? Deprotonate the OH. Now you might say, uh, is it is there enough distance there? I don't care. Because this represents a bazillion molecules if that's a real world, real, real, real word, which it isn't. 
So let's just make it a billion. So there's a billion of these molecules, and so that minus is going to react with another OH of another molecule. But the key thing is that when I'm done, I've got an O minus. Over here, I've got a hydrogen attached to that carbon, and my Grignard is gone. So when the CO2 gets added, nothing happens because there's nothing there. So if I need to protect the OH first, I need to turn it into something that I can remove. And that's where we talked about using the CL attached to the silicon with the three methyl groups. And so that would convert, so reacting this alcohol with that molecule with this would have converted that to And now, now I can react that with magnesium because now this group isn't going to do anything. It's not going to react with anything. But the only thing that group will react with is fluoride. The only thing this will react with is F minus. And the F minus will take the trimethyl silicon group off and leave it as an, o as an OH. So that's what I meant by the protection. So it would be probably a good thing to sort of remember that you can protect with this what you get and then what you can use to sort of deprotect with the fluoride. Just saying. But that that silo and that silo ether was in the top hat. It was at the end of the alcohols chapter of of top hat. And well and, and the thing was that this is called a silo ether. If you have other questions, email me, come see me. Um, so what I'm so actually once I take this PowerPoint and I figure out where I ended, I'm gonna put the PowerPoint, this just one PowerPoint online for both classes. It'll start morning class and then you guys end class so you can see what I went over there. And I will post, I'll post both videos in both folders because they may have asked about something or I may have gone over something a little bit differently than w with yours. So you can always just take the YouTube and kind of, you know, squ scroll through it and see what's there. Um, so that way you can have, you can see what I did with them and that. Okay. But if you have questions, if you didn't get your... Um, graded stuff. I have a couple of those up here. Um, Amanda, Spencer. So if you did get them, fine. If you didn't, then um, come up and get them. Dylan, I think I have. Otherwise, I will see you on Friday. Don't touch them, that's a purple violation. <laughs> it's a purple violation right now to see somebody score. That's what it wasn't even registered. <laughs> I believe, didn't see it. I believe, I, I, believe, I, believe, I believe that. Yeah. There you go. Thanks. Josh, Shannon. I think there's, is there another one for you? Uh, I think this, this was the only one I turned in. Like, Gray, so. Dylan, you. so Dylan, you've got that one. And Josh there. And 
and that's everybody that was here. Oh. And the answer keys were all online, so 